The cathode ray tube was invented in the middle of the 19th century. Of course, it eventually became the modern television tube. But before that misfortune, it actually served a useful purpose that I'd like to tell you about. Here is a particularly simple cathode ray tube. It consists of an evacuated glass tube with two electrodes inside. I'm going to apply 20,000 volts across those two electrodes, but first I have to turn out the lights so you can see what happens. Okay. Now you see what happens is that it glows inside, and also this Maltese cross casts a shadow on the end. The Maltese cross is the positive electrode. I'd like you to notice something else about it too. I can easily move around the shadow just by bringing up a simple bar magnet like that. Okay? Right from the beginning, people suspected that that glow was actually a beam of charged particles because it was so easily deflected with an ordinary magnet. But to prove that that was true, you would have to deflect it also with an electric field. And for some strange reason, that didn't work. Then along came a British physicist named J.J. Thompson. Thompson was a brilliant experimental physicist, but strangely enough, he was very clumsy. In fact, the legend is he broke every cathode ray tube he ever touched. <laughs> this is a replica of one of Thompson's tubes, and like one of his own, it's also broken. <laughs> Thompson realized that the reason the electric field didn't work was because the vacuum in the tube wasn't good enough. And he also figured out that the reason the vacuum wasn't good was because of gas that was stuck on the walls of the tube when the glass blower sealed it off. And he figured he could solve that problem by heating the tube as it was being sealed off. And so he had the tubes placed in an oven to be heated while the glass blower was sealing it. And that trick worked. After he did that, the electric field deflected the beam. And so Thompson was able to show that the beam was made of electrically charged particles. And he quickly showed that the same charged particles came from every kind of matter. What Thompson had done was the first splitting of the atom. He had shown that the ultimate indivisible particle of matter really had internal parts after all. The honor of naming the new particle should have gone to its discoverer, J.J. Thompson. And he wanted to call it the corpuscle. But that name didn't stick because it really had already been named. It was called the electron. And so J.J. Thompson split the atom and discovered the electron by baking his tubes. <laughs> this name, the electron, started a tradition in physics of naming things with individual units with names that end in ONS. So that, for example, the individual unit of light is called a photon, the unit of sound is called a phonon, the unit of matter is a proton, and we have neutrons, and so on. In fact, recently sociologists have discovered that even human populations have individual units called persons. Once the atom had been split and the electron had been discovered, the crucial job that remained was to measure the electric charge of the electron. And that job was done in one of the classic experiments in all of physics by the great American experimentalist, Robert Andrews Millikan. A small beaker of oil, a sturdy iron pot, just enough power. A dash of discipline, a measure of creativity, and perhaps a touch of genius. These were the essential ingredients in the physicist's very experimental recipe. The scientist, Robert A. Milliken. The achievement, 
measuring the value of the charge of the electron. The preparation time, almost half a century. 1868, the year a young nation still shaky from the Civil War was linked together by the Transcontinental Railroad. That same year, Robert A. Milliken was born, the son of an Iowa preacher. He set out across the plains for Ohio to study the classics at Oberlin College. Later, because there wasn't an opening to teach Latin or the history of ancient Greece, he became an instructor of elementary physics there. He showed promise. Columbia University awarded him a fellowship in physics, which he lost after the first year. The loss of support made him doubt, but not give up on his ability as a scientist. He went back to the Midwest, where he studied under Albert A. Michelson at the University of Chicago. Michelson had been awarded the Nobel Prize for developing an extraordinary instrument to measure distances by the interference of light waves. Milliken wanted more than a summer session at Chicago. He wanted to launch his career in physics there. To prepare himself further, he visited a number of legendary universities and laboratories of the old world. Before North America achieved prominence, Europe was the continent that most inspired scientific discoveries. Before the First World War, Millikan's inspiration was molded not only by the long shadows of Newton and Galileo, Kepler and Copernicus, but by the fact that he himself could walk among the living giants of his own day. The Englishman William Ramsey, who discovered helium, neon, xenon, and krypton, Wilhelm Röntgen, German discoverer of the X-ray. Guglielmo Marconi and Karl Braun, who developed the wireless telegraph. Like Leibniz and Newton in calculus, they made their discovery at the same time, but certainly not together. Albert Einstein, Max Planck, and Johannes Stark were hard at work in Germany. But the greatest direct influences on Millikan seem to have been British. J.J. Thompson and his student, H.A. Wilson, at the Cavendish Laboratories. The electron, x-rays, and radiation. Such discoveries made physics an exciting frontier, and he was eager to cross its threshold. Yet Millikan was nothing if not careful in his work, and it would take a decade before he began to make his mark in the world of science. He was already in his 40s and had only just become an associate professor at the University of Chicago. But about the same time Marie Curie was awarded a Nobel Prize in chemistry, she'd already received one in physics, he began to measure the charge of an electron. His groundwork had been laid by Thompson, a Nobel laureate in 1906 for his investigations on how gases conduct electricity. This brilliant Englishman had discovered the electron and developed the cloud method to measure its charge. This chamber was invented to study atmospheric clouds, but in the hands of Thompson and his colleague, H.A. Wilson, it had gone above and beyond its original purpose. A sudden expansion of air, saturated with water vapor, forms clouds. If there are dust particles on which to condense, that supersaturated vapor would also condense on ions. Electrically charged particles created by an X-ray tube. Each drop of water would have the electric charge of a single electron. With this insight, Thompson and Wilson set out to determine the average charge on an average droplet. The cloud chamber method was difficult. The experiments, which involved measuring the rate of fall of the cloud in an electric field, were subject to countless uncertainties. Nonetheless, they finally obtained an estimate of the electron charge. Only an estimate. But it was correct in its order of magnitude. 
To a man like Robert A. Milliken, it was an open door to his particular talent. Precise measurements of the most fundamental physical quantities. Milliken repeated Wilson's experiments at the University of Chicago. To ionize the gaseous cloud in the chamber, he used x-rays at first and then small amounts of radium. He tried a more powerful electric field in the chamber. If this worked, it would be powerful enough to balance the force of gravity and to keep the cloud suspended without motion. Now all this looked pretty good on paper, but when things got moving, there was a little problem. With such powerful electric forces in the chamber, the water vapor cloud quickly disappeared. But Milliken turned this problem into an advantage. When the electrical field was turned on, individual droplets stayed in view. Milliken imagined measuring single water droplets rather than an entire cloud. If it were possible to make measurements on the droplets, the effects of individual electrons could be detected. A brilliant insight, but not without a problem. Water evaporates. Instead of water, Milliken wondered, why not use droplets of oil? Oil, unlike water, doesn't evaporate. In 1907, at the University of Chicago, it began to fall into place. Given the apparatus to produce a mist of oil, Milliken was increasingly confident that the electrical charge of an electron could be accurately measured. Under his guidance, Harvey Fletcher, a graduate student from Brigham Young University, suggested an atomizer. Fletcher's first apparatus for the oil drop experiment. Like Millikan's original idea, was simple, powerful, and altogether brilliant. It was a combination that began to work. The essence of the experiment is to apply an electric field to an electrically charged drop of oil falling through the air and then to analyze the result using Newton's powerful equation F equals MA. The mass of the drop times the acceleration is equal to the sum of all the forces acting on it. What forces act on a falling drop of oil? There's the force of gravity, of course. And then there's the effect of viscosity. An oil drop if only for a millionth of a second, has the acceleration of a free-falling body. But after that first millionth of a second, the oil drop reaches terminal velocity. Like any sphere falling through a viscous fluid, it falls at constant speed. The viscous force on a moving sphere, worked out by the English physicist George Stokes in the 19th century, is equal to 6 pi times the radius of the sphere times the viscosity of the air, times the speed of the sphere. Very quickly, the speed grows until the viscous force is big enough to balance gravity. Instead of accelerating, the sphere falls at constant speed. Millikan had to measure this speed in order to find out how big each drop was. Even with a powerful telescope, an individual drop was too small to see. What Millikan saw looked like a star in the night sky, a pinpoint of light that couldn't be resolved into its spherical shape. But by watching his star drift slowly from one scratch mark to another on his telescope, and using the known density of the oil, he could measure its precise size. Now he would turn on the electric field and create an electric force equal to the electric field strength times the charge on the drop. 
that's the charge Millikan was really after. Due to one electron, or at most a small number of them, it would be an integer multiple of the fundamental unit of electric charge. With the electric force, he could drive the drop upward until, once again, it reached a constant speed. Together with the speed he'd measured with the field off, the new speed gave him everything he needed to find the charge. The experiment was designed with the most exquisite care, a hallmark of Millikan's work. To minimize turbulence on the oil drops as they drifted between parallel plates, a heavy iron pot was designed to house and protect the plates. Air would be filtered through glass wool before entering an atomizer designed to spray the finest mist of oil droplets into the chamber. Even the light to illuminate the droplets was filtered. A solution of copper sulfate and a meter-long tube of water would remove the light's excess heat. When the time came, Millikan saw to it that nothing would disturb his experiment. Stopwatch in hand, hour after hour he would peer through his telescope, through the porthole and into the chamber. Deep within the heart of the chamber, he would see a single charged droplet of oil glowing like a star. Under the influences of gravity and viscosity, the droplet would fall. Down through inner space, the star would fall until it would reach the top scratch mark and Millikan would start his stopwatch. It would keep falling until it would reach the bottom mark. Millikan would enter the time it took each drop to fall. Then he'd turn on the electric field, turning the oil droplet into a rising star. At the bottom mark, he'd start the watch, letting it run until the rising drop would cross the finish line on top. Again and again, he'd record how long it took to rise and fall, often observing a single droplet hours on end. Hundreds of measurements were taken, recorded, mused over, and eventually analyzed to give the most accurate measurement ever made of the fundamental unit of electric charge. Millikan's final published measurement, 4.77 times 10 to the minus 10 electrostatic units, was only 2% different from his result prior to using oil in the experiment. Robert A. Millikan's fort was precision, an ability to detect and eliminate error, and with extraordinary diligence and creativity to improve on existing tools. In public statements, and there were many as he became an elder statesman of the academic community, he used every opportunity to extol the scientific method. The scientist's responsibility was to make measurements without bias and to let nature dictate the answers. The scientist's job was to make each measurement, no matter how painstakingly, and to publish everything. Determining the significance of the data, that was the job of the scientist's peers. Millikan's peers understood the significance of this work. In 1923, he became the first native-born American to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. Millikan went on to head the California Institute of Technology, an American institution, and to become one himself. His name became and remains synonymous with scientific progress. In the first half of the 20th century, his image, next to Albert Einstein's, was that of the most famous physicist in North America. I'd also like to show you what the experiment itself looked like. 
There's one thing I particularly want you to notice. It's this canister right over here. If it looks familiar to you, it's because the same one is right there at the end of the bench. That's Millikan's own oil drop experiment, still functioning after all these years. Now I have something truly extraordinary I would like to show you. When Millikan did his experiment, he gathered together his results, and he wrote them up to be published in a scientific journal for all the world to see. But before that, while he was all alone in his laboratory, he had to have a place to write down the results of his experiment as he was doing it. That place was his laboratory, laboratory notebook. notebook. It was never intended for anyone else to see. It was for Millikan's eyes only. This page is dated Wednesday, December 20th, 1911. Here, Millikan writes down the temperature and the pressure in the room. And here, under the letter G for gravity, a series of figures, each one of which is the time it took his oil drop to fall between the two scratch marks on his telescopes. Then, a similar column under F for field, the electric field and again, the times it takes his oil drop to fall. From those times, he calculates velocities, V1, V2, and so on. Using those velocities, he finds the logarithm of V1 plus V2, so he can add it to one half the logarithm of V1. And finally, here, Millikan reaches his result. And then he writes, this is almost exactly right. But how can he say that? He's supposed to be measuring a fundamental constant of nature whose value he doesn't know in advance. Why does he say this is right? On another page, he writes, beauty. On this page, beauty publish. And another, very low, something wrong. And then he makes a very revealing note. Not sure of distance, 1.273. There it is. When he gets a result he doesn't like, he doesn't throw it away because that would be cheating. What he does instead is to examine the apparatus to find something wrong. So he has a reason for throwing it away. Of course, when he gets a result that he does like, he doesn't examine the apparatus nearly as carefully to find out what went right. Obviously, that creates a powerful bias in his method to get the result he wants. Another page. Here. Best yet. Beauty. Publish. And so on. For pages and pages and pages. The point is not at all that Robert Millikan was a bad scientist. He wasn't. He was a great scientist. But by examining these notes, we can get a brief insight into how science is really done. What Millikan was doing wasn't cheating. He was using his scientific judgment. And in fact, it must be that way. Because no one ever stumbles onto a scientific discovery. Every discovery is made in the course of an experiment that was exquisitely designed to give the results that the scientist expects to find. And the scientist knows that quite possibly fame and other rewards will be waiting if a great discovery is made. But then, what prevents someone from making a discovery that isn't real? The answer is, the experiment can be repeated somewhere else, by someone else, to see if it's right. It's often said that the immense success of some scientific enterprise was due to something called the scientific method. And that a key part of that method is the unprejudiced, dispassionate collection of scientific data and that if other fields were able to imitate that magic scientific method, they could be just as successful. Well, in fact, that just isn't the case. 
passion and prejudice are never very far from the scientific process. The safeguard is not disinterested scientists, but rather the fact that all scientists believe at the very core of their beings that experiments can be repeated. That belief is the central tenet in every scientist's faith. And I have faith that you'll be back here next time. To this day, Robert A. Millikan's oil drop experiment stands out as one of the classic measurements in the history of physics. Annenberg Media. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1 800 Learner and visit us at www.learner.org.